Well, welcome to another session of the Frank Talk Radio Dialogues, an initiative by the Steve Biko Foundation, which is proudly supported by the Open Society Foundation for South Africa. I'm your host, Faith Mongop, and we're broadcasting live from the YFM Live Space. Now, seeing that the 27th of February marks the 35th anniversary of the death of South African freedom fighter Robert Subukwe, tonight we explore the legacy of Robert Subukwe as well as the relevance of that legacy in modern day South Africa. I'm not alone, of course. I'm joined by our panelists. Please welcome Professor Gwandiwe Gondo, who's the director of the Center of African Studies. I'm also joined by Sol Panduka, who's YFM Breakfast Show co host, as well as DJ Warris, YFM Evening Show host. And on the line, we are joined by Mr. Taimi Kaplaiki, who's the director of the Pan African Foundation. Uh, Mr. Kaplaiki, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you speak a bit louder? Ah, uh, yes. We're just going to try to increase yes, our levels I can there. Hear you. Uh, can you hear us? Fine. Thank you very much for joining us this evening on the line. He is, of course, still in Cape Town, and he'll be participating in our conversations throughout uh, this evening's session. Now, if you remember, if you would like to be a part of this evening's discussion, the number to dial is 011-772-0992. Do feel free to send us an email, drop us a tweet, and also go onto the Steve Beagle Foundation Facebook page, where you'll be able then to table your comments, your questions, as well as go onto the Steve Beagle Foundation Twitter page, and that Twitter handle is at Beagle Foundation. I'm going to repeat it, at Beagle Foundation, or else give us a ring on 011-772-0992. I did say to you, we're discussing the legacy of uh, Robert Subukwe. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us this evening. And of course, we're looking forward to a robust debate. Have we already? Oh, well, yeah, let's just get away. As ready as we'll ever be. Yep. Are you taking a sip there, so Getting a little bit nervous, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Not even, eh? Look, uh, Professor, I think the first thing, uh, especially when you're looking at the legacy and seeing that we are a youth radio station, we, we need to be sort of reintroduced to the ideologies of uh, Robert Subuka. And politically, uh, Subuka was strongly an Africanist, obviously, believing that the future of South Africa should be in the hands of black South Africans. Now, in his speech, actually, at the University of Forte, he states, and this is what he says, he says that that is why we preach the doctrine of love, love for Africa. We can never do enough for Africa, nor can we love her enough. Looking at how South Africans tend to still have this perception uh, that they are an island apart from the rest of Africa. How do we introduce, or reintroduce for that matter, the ideology of Subukwe, of being a proud African, but in a manner that does not, or that is inclusive of all race groups, so that we don't limit the discussion uh, to it being just a color issue. So how do we reintroduce that back again? Well, I think one of the things that we, we, we obviously need to, <coughs> to do is to strengthen initiatives like this one by the Steve Vigo Foundation. And, and, and I was actually honored at some point, I think it was in 2011, where I delivered the Robert Sobukwe Memorial Lecture at the University of Fort Hare. Mm. <coughs> uh, I, was, I was humbled and I was, I was very touched. So I think we need to, we need to promote dialogue we need to encourage also a culture of reading among South Africans. And, and, and I would be very happy if at some point in South Africa we could start translating the writings of Robert Sobukwe into African languages. Translate them to Sisutu, translate them into Venda, translate them into Isizulu, and translate them into Isitoza. Because Sobukwe's message is transgenerational. Mm. Sobukwe's message is relevant today as it was yesterday. It's a pity that Robert Sobukwe's message is, 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 is heard in harsh tones and is hidden. It's, it's like a candle hidden beneath the table in the New South Africa. Whereas it is only now that we need Robert Sobukwe. It is only now that we need Stephen Biko in South Africa. Do feel free to jump in, guys. Good night. Definitely. I mean, I agree with the professor's points, many of the points he made, but I, I feel as though you're saying that we should, you know, be, be, be reading more, right? And I feel as though your generation hasn't really taken the time to get to understand the youth right now. And I was told, and I'm going to be at this talk, and we're going to be talking about the, the, the legacy of Robert Subukwe. And... It's a shame that I had to Google him in order to find out what it was all about. And when I had to read and I read further, and I, I share your sentiments when you say his thoughts and ideas are more relevant today um, than they were then, because the reason that they came into place in the first place are, are, are more evident now than they were then. Now, the fact that you know, his legacy is almost dying out 
The fact that black consciousness by Steve Biko is not even existent anymore. However, the reasons that that kind of thinking was inspired in the first place is even more right now. You know, so I just want to know what happened, what, what went wrong. You know, when you're saying we must read more, are you saying that young people must go to the libraries every day? Because we don't learn about Steve Biko, we don't learn about Robert Subuko in our curriculums. No, I don't remember learning about him. You know, there are people in the struggle who I didn't have to Google, like Nelson Mandela, for example. But I know so much about him. You know, and when I, I read about people whose message is so relevant today, but I have to Google uh, or I have to go to the library to find out about him, it's a bit of a problem. And I was shocked when I found out, okay, he founded, and Robert Sobuko found, was one of the founding people of the PAC, and yet that same party today is, is, is non-existent to the youth. You know, it's non-existent to the youth, I don't know about it. I was even shocked to find out they have a youth wing. You know, so what has happened? What has gone wrong? I mean, if their message is so relevant today, what has happened? How come the youth does know about it? You know, I'm on Twitter every day. I've got 23,000 followers, but I've never seen any one of my, my peers, my youth, tweet about these things. You know, so what has happened? How, how, what happened? How come we don't know about these people? Because their legacy, I honestly, you know, believe that it's, it's so relevant, especially in the youth right now. The youth, everybody's pulling their own direction. Waris is here, he's trying to make it big. I'm here trying to make it big. And from where we stand, we're just trying to reap the rewards of the freedom that was given to us. But those people who fought for the freedom and gave us the freedom, they didn't really give us a particular direction where to take that freedom as a youth. And maybe as a youth, I think, like, interestingly, so saw mention it, we're trying to do things for ourselves. Yeah. Um, I think something that we can learn from people like Robert Smukwe and Steve Pico is that they were trying to do things for everybody else. Um, you know, the messages that they taught were for all Africans, yeah. not just for all South Africans. Yeah. Um, whereas now, like, the youth of today is just like, I need to see for me and get what I can and get out. I don't, you know, I don't think they necessarily, I don't use the word care, but I think it just fits in the sentence. I don't think they necessarily care about everybody else. And um, also in the question, like when you, or rather in your answer, you said that um, his work should be translated into other languages. I think that the ones who can read, uh, by and large, can read English, okay? Why are they not reading the books in English? Do you think that maybe if we put it in other languages, other people will read it, other youth will read it? Or will it just be easier for your generation, or even Robert Sabuka's generation, older people, to say, oh, this is nice, this book has been translated into Zulu, let me grab it and read it. Would the average person, youth, that listens to YFM, for example, say, oh, well, they've translated it into Venda, I'd better go out and grab it. You know, what would, what would the benefit of that be? I'm going to actually invite Mr. Kapalaki to actually yes. join in on that conversation. Mr. Kapalaki, of course, is joining us on the line. He is, from, uh, he is in Cape Town currently. Uh, you've heard, uh, uh, Mr. Tamika Kapalaki, the, the different sentiments shared um, from the youth's perspective. What do you have to say to that in terms of ensuring that this legacy stays relevant right now? Because as Saul was mentioning a little bit earlier, it's almost as if the legacy is dying. And I think we've just lost Mr. Kaplaki. We'll try to get him back on the line. And um, while we are doing that, uh, Professor, I think that you should be able to, to field that question from the gentleman. Yes. So, so let, me, I think let me underline this for a start. You know, you know uh, there are people who get born posthumously. Hmm. And, and I must tell you now, Robert Sobukwe, Stephen Binko, even if we can think for now, their legacies are dying. I'm telling you, they are not dying. These beautiful sons of the African continent will be born posthumously. They will be born posthumously because the liberal subjugation of the radical content of the liberation struggle. It is a phase, it's an epochal thing. Because if, if, if you look at, you must read the history of the African continent, the steps, many African countries and stages that they had to pass through to get to where they are. I believe that this is a particular so phase that we are going through, where the, the radical content of the liberation struggle was completely overhauled. We, we negotiated, back online as soon we as negotiated we peace well and good, we'll do but peace without material dividend does not last. In about the next few and it is in that context 
were the radical messages of Stephen Biko. Black men, you are on your own. The radical messages of Robert Sobukwe, the land to the masses, they are still going to be relevant in future. So I don't believe that their messages are actually dying out. Well, maybe the political parties which, which used to advance these messages are actually collapsing and being absorbed by the ruling party, but the ideas, I still believe, they are going to continue to move. I, 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 do, I do concede to the issues raised about how do we get to understand the youth in South Africa and how do we, how do we get to connect with them so that these ideas, they begin to read, explore, understand them. I think uh, I do concede. We have failed in that regard. You see what happened in South Africa in 1990? Uh, I think there, there was some kind of euphoria and excitement which gripped the whole country. And as a result, some of the issues we needed to interrogate in detail actually fell uh, in the cracks. And some of them are only beginning to emerge uh, 18 years after our liberation. Translating the writings of Robert Sobuk and Stephen Biko into indigenous languages, I think it's important so that we can, we, we can open the spaces of discourse around these ideas to the, to the poorest of the poor, mm. to the marginalized, to the, to, 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 to the rural peasantry, mm. yes, in the villages. They, they, they must get to engage in the conversation that we're engaging in. It is in that light that I think it's important to translate these messages. Now, of course, we're going to go for a quick break. When we come back, and actually like your views, uh, even during the break, is the message of Robert Sobuke being communicated effectively to the young people so that the young people may be able to continue with this legacy? Give us your thoughts on 11 Do remember to send us a tweet at Biko Foundation. That is the Twitter handle to use. We're going to go for a quick break. When we come back, more on the legacy of Robert Sobuke. And uh, in the meantime, we will be trying to get a hold of Mr. Tami Kablaiki, who unfortunately we've just disconnected with. In a few moments, we'll be back shortly straight after this. Stay with us. We are broadcasting live from the YFM Live space. Uh, just before the break, I asked you the question, is the message of Robert Sobuke being communicated to effectively to the young people so that that legacy can continue living where after Generation X has gone? Give us your views on that one. At Beagle Foundation is a Twitter handle, 011-772-0992. Gentlemen, before the break, obviously, we were discussing about, and of course, we had uh, the professor saying that that legacy is not dead. Uh, all the sentiments that are shared by Robert, and the ideologies say, uh, shared by Robert Sobuke, those are not dead. In your perspective, though, and, and as you mentioned, Saul, that you've got 23,000 followers, but nobody's mentioning that legacy. Warwick, how do we start getting young people engaging in this whole talk so that we do not uh, sort of uh, forget our icons and these and the ideologies that have been left with us continue even in our old age so that we can obviously then pass it on to our children as well as children's children. When do we start communicating that message effectively? I think we need to start by talk, teaching about it before we start talking about it. So if it could be like maybe incorporated into the syllabus at school, um, that, you know, these are the people responsible for where we are today. This is some of the things that they did in a different time, you know, under different ruler, rule, uh, a different regime. And, you know, they never, they, they were never afraid to, to speak up. And this is what it teaches us today. Instead of maybe the syllabus including things about other histories all over the world. You know what I mean? Why don't we learn about our own? Uh, interestingly, before we came here, when we were discussing it, um, one of my friends mentioned that he knows so much more about, it's a silly example, but like Christopher Columbus. That's, you know, that's in your syllabus, but for right now we've got real problems that some of, that learning about some of this might help in the future to decide. Because also, interestingly, in your answer previously, um, you were saying that, um, you know, like the political parties, the political parties by and large are made up of people who lived in Robert Sabuka and Steve Biko's time, and they are in power now. So they know all about it. Maybe they take it for granted that, oh, well, we know all about it. And whoever takes over the reins from us, because we are in our 60s and 70s, whoever takes over the reins from us, are we really doing enough to teach them about it so that the next people in power 
you know what I mean, sort of carry the message because it's just going to dwindle and dwindle. It, like what Saul was saying about it being dead, maybe it's not dead already. It's alive in people like you mm -hmm. who know about it. It's alive in other people who know about it. It might even be alive in those leaders of these political parties that are in power now. It might be alive in them, but is it alive in the generation that has to come in and take over from them? Is it alive in the generation that it's going to be our problem now, 10 years from now? So when are we going to start learning about it? You know, if it is included in the syllabus, who's going to be responsible for that? You know what I mean? Sitting with an education department happy with 30% pass for matric. I just don't see putting it... I think if we trust them, I think we're going to come up short. Okay. Um, to, to answer Faith's question, I mean, um, she, she, well, paraphrases, she asked, you know, whether... The, the message of you know, Robert Subukwe, is it being effectively communicated you know, to young people? And from what I know about it today, you know, is that young people need to go out there, get educated. And the reason, the primary reason that they have to get educated is to empower the next African person, is so that all Africans are eventually empowered. Hence, you had guys like... Steve Biko went out there to be doctors, and, and uh, Robert Subuko was a teacher. You know, it, it's, it's, it's for that, to take those tools and use them to plow back into Africa, for the love of Africa. Mm -hmm. However, today, we all want to get degrees. I want to get an engineering degree so I can earn 80,000 rand a month for myself and my family. You know, and the re I was in high school, we were told that there were not enough science teachers and math teachers. However, people are going out there to study the math and the science, but they want to be a actual scientist, etc., etc., to enrich themselves. Or you know, they want to go teach abroad. Or they want money. to go teach abroad, exactly. And all we're doing is we're taking advantage of what we were told when you know we were past this freedom. You know, with with freedom comes comes. The, the, the constitution, with the constitution comes the Bill of Rights, which says you're allowed to buy this, you've got the right not to buy that. You know, you've got the right to enrich yourself, you've got the right to help the next poor person, or you've got the right not to even care about them and just enrich yourself. So that's what we're doing. So I really think it hasn't been communicated effectively to the youth because we are not living that. And, you know, one of the, 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 the teachings as well of Robert Subuko, from my understanding, was that African culture should take how can I put it, should take uh, uh, um, um, priority in Africa more than any other cultures in Africa and we should be proud mm -hmm. of being African. But it's not happening, honestly, to be, to, you know, honestly amongst the youth. You know, it's, it's not. And that Africans need to be proud, young Africans need to be proud of being African and to believe that their Africanness can take over the economy and own the economy. However, we're in a position where some of the young Africans are believing that maybe if I'm more white, I'll, I'll, I'll perhaps reap these rewards of this economy. Or more and, American. Or, or, more or more American or whatever. You know, so, so, so I honestly believe that the message of you know, Robert Subukwe is not being... Um, communicated uh, 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 um, uh, effectively in, in modern day, especially to the youth. Gentlemen, I'd like to take us a little bit of a step back here. Um, we're mentioning the, the different aspects of Robert Sudeikis' message, but I think that so that we do not sort of miss out and misinterpret uh, the discussion today, let's go back, Professor, and talk about this message. I mean, one of them, uh, Saul just rightly mentioned there, was the fact that we need to be proud of being African. But if I'm sitting at home and I'm listening to this conversation for the first time and I just tuned in, I'm, be, I'm stuck because I do not know what this whole talk is about. Robert Subuko, his ideologies, his message. Let, let, very quickly, what was that message that we need to really so bravely as South Africans, young South Africans, hold on to? Well, since I think the first message, which, which, which when I read Subuko's writings and his speeches, I would say it summarized in the slogan of the, of the Pan-Africanist Congress during the early years. And their slogan was, serve suffer, sacrifice. Yeah? Serve, suffer, sacrifice. These are very important attributes for of leadership. May I just ask, serve, suffer, sacrifice for? For the liberation yeah. of the African people. Yes. Okay. And, 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 and the second teaching, um, let me say the set of teachings from Robert Sobukwe revolved around the, 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 the land question. Let me say land and economy. People who don't own, eh? I'm not say, talking about people who, have, people who don't have a share, but people who don't own the material means of production in their own country can never determine their destiny. Their destiny. That was so good, yes. 
That's why the issue of land and economy was so central to Somukwe's teachings. And, and thirdly, the third level of, of set of teachings of, of, of Robert Somukwe, it was around the issue of African affirmations. Yeah. Uh, that, that, that it, it is in Southern Africa, and maybe worse in South Africa, where the impact of colonialism has been so enduring. Other, other countries were colonized, the Chinese were once colonized, but the effects of colonialism have, have been so enduring in Southern Africa and worse in South, in South Africa. And why is that? Why is that? It's because the colonizers defeated us on two very important issues that are so core to the definition of who you are as a human being. That is, number one, our indigenous religion, and number two, indigenous languages. When you read Sobukwe's writings, you find that he is so sharp-pointed in underlining the significance of these three key aspects. The first one is leadership. Leadership, which suffers, uh, sacrifices, and, 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 and is prepared to, to, to do everything. For, for, for the people. Number two, the land and economics. Yeah? A people who own the means of production in the land of their death are able to define their destiny. And thirdly, African affirmations, our indigenous religions and our indigenous languages. In my understanding of the readings of Sobu and, and of reading Sobu as well, I think these are the areas where he was very strong. Okay, but now we sit to the leadership that if you're looking on the outside, looking in, they suffered so that now they may lead, but they're not suffering anymore. The people are suffering. Mm. You understand? And it also seems like a leadership that serves itself first. Nobody in leadership is poor. Do you know what I mean? Public servants, it's, it's almost like now the dream has become, mm. if I need to, if, like let's say for example, I want to be a leader of tomorrow, okay? And I want to get into politics for argument's sake, okay? Because I feel that in that field, I can maybe have a party and my party is going to preach this message and this is where we're going to take the people. I think now, it's more like a dream lifestyle where if I get in there, I can get a tender. I can enrich myself and then I can pretty much do whatever I want because I'll have money and I'll have power. So are they, is the leadership necessarily living out Robert Sabuque's message? Are they following his teachings? Well, I think what you're talking to now is, is what I call the, the moral climate of our epoch. Mm. The moral climate of our epoch is, is, is totally different. Uh, the rise of a consumerist culture, yes. Yes. opulence, opulence, and 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 and, 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 and uh, the rush for power, fame, and material wealth. Yes. That, that that is why I said at the beginning, it is today that it's Robert Sobukwe and Steve Biko become so important in the lives of black people. I, I get so worried when you look at, 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 at uh, the, the life of an ordinary black person outside the city centers. They, some of them lack role models. Some of them have actually very bad role models. Mm. And, and, and the rush is to get out of poverty, mm. irrespective of the means that one uses to get out of poverty. Just to get out as quick as possible. Yes. We glorify people in the media and everywhere and celebrities that have made money without an education. It's like I can become a rapper, make money, live the lifestyle and the life, but <laughs> I'll just barely have a matric. But if I can write good rhymes, that's me away. Or I can become a DJ and I can charge five, ten thousand rand per gig and I can make music and release songs and I'll be so penduga or I'll be DJ Wallace. Instead of one way it's you know, if I get my education, I can be better and I can be more. And I think importantly, I can help 
my fellow man and my country. Earlier Saul said that nowadays, it's like when I, I went to varsity and when I was in varsity, I remember in first year, there must have been about 2,000 people that were all there to study BCom accounting. They were studying BCom accounting, not necessarily because they could become chartered accountants one day. They were studying it because they wanted to become chartered accountants one day because they heard of the salary that chartered accountants bring in. In second year, that 2,000 was 1,000, and by third year, that 1,000 was 200. And not everybody finished. What if those 1,800 that fell off, why couldn't they have, maybe they could have studied something else, like communication, for argument's sake. I'm not saying that accounting is necessarily more difficult, or, you know, I'm not trying to say one course is more difficult than the other. But they were, uh, what I'm trying to say is that those people were studying what they were studying because they were after the paycheck that one can earn at the end for themselves, very importantly. You know, there needs to be a culture of, if I become a doctor, I want to work at Belaguanet Hospital. Because at Bella, there is an oversupply of patients, okay, and not enough doctors to service those patients. And a nursing staff that nine times out of 10 couldn't really care and it's just waiting for their tea time, lunch hour, etc. It's like it's a chore, you know? Robert Sabukwe was a teacher. I bet you every morning when he woke up, he was proud to be a teacher. My grandfather was a teacher for 40 years. And I remember he'd wake up at five to polish his shoes. So that when he got to school, and he said to you, your shoes are not polished, he was doing so with a polished shoe. Whereas now, if teachers don't get their way, they strike. You can't, why are you striking? What about those children that you're leaving for three months without their syllabus being continued? How many of them are going to fail? How many of them need your help? So it, we, need to, we need to glorify it in such a way where it becomes, that's what you need to dream of being. I wish I could have been a stockbroker, but I'm not a stockbroker. I'm a DJ, I'm one of the lucky few. There's not that many of us here, nor are there many of us at the other radio stations. But that doesn't, I bet you more people want to be DJs than there are people that want to be stockbrokers. You get what I'm saying? Or engineers, or doctors. It just seems like nerds do it. It's not no longer the cool thing to do. Yeah, and I mean, another reason, um, it sounded like the listener was saying that, you know, books are the key, but the youth doesn't really want to read. Not necessarily. The thing is, that the youth of today, we are very motivated. And we want to know when we do X and Y, the result is this and that. What we and we are always told, books are the key, books are the key. And no, no one really you know, tells us a key to what. And then we take the assumption that they're the key to become successful, to make it big in life. And then as what I say, we see people who have made it big without necessarily the books. Whereas, you know, they should, you know, uh, I reiterate the message of Robert Sabuku that the books are the key to serve, you know, like you say, so that one day you can serve to the youth. But we're not told that. What we're told is that you must read, you must read, you must read. So that's why young people don't, you know, are seen as not necessarily reading. That's because we're not told why necessarily we should read. And that's why we spend, like you said, our life is very digital. That's why we spend on Twitter. If you ask me why I'm on Twitter, Look, I spend all day reading on Twitter. It might be small bits of info, but it's reading. You know, to inform myself, ask the person why are you, are you on Twitter, it's to inform themselves. So young people these days will be like that. You know, we want to do something now and know that the, the immediate result, or where is this thing taking me to? And if you're gonna tell me that the only reason I must read is so that I can, I can become educated, get a job, probably I won't because I've seen someone on TV who didn't read much but had a job. So if we, we change, you know, the perception of reading and making it cool and also telling the young, the youth, us, why we should be reading and n not necessarily for self-gain, but for the selflessness, uh, you know, that is in the message of Robert Sibukwe and Steve Biko, that you are actually reading to impart the knowledge one day. Maybe young people will read. I certainly will. I was going to say, just further from uh, Saul's point that he just made and the professor's point earlier about how, like, the materialistic side of it. Maybe with some of the money, young people should be incentivized into, like, let's say for example, if you, uh, this is another thing that we actually, just when we were discussing it earlier, we, we mentioned that maybe could work, is that, say for example, it, well, every year when the matrix's finish, we see the top 10 matrix in Gauteng, or the top 10 matrix in the Western Cape, whatever. 
It's always the top 10. Maybe we should actually give that platform to the top 2,000. Yeah. And it should be a case of if you are in the top 2,000, you must study. Not you must as in we're going to force you to. But you must as in there should be no obstacle between you and getting your degree and serving your country. In other words, if I am from Newcastle and I come from a single parent house with eight siblings, but I got six A's, I should not be allowed to go and work at Checkers. There needs to be a plan for my family to survive, A, eh? and there needs to be a plan to make me a doctor in the next seven years because I am a South African and I can serve this country well as a doctor. After that, I can come and work at Terra and be paid a salary that I would be getting if I were working in Canada. And maybe we can shave some money from somewhere, but we need to find it. Otherwise, there's simply no hope. We can't operate on the system we currently operate on. Where I want to become whatever I want to become, an engineer, so I can go work in Dubai and earn dollars and not pay tax. That shouldn't be... It should be, I want to become an engineer so I can build bridges in Nguavuma, in Natal, so people don't have to cross the river. <laughs> you understand? Maybe that's where the thinking needs to be. So, however we incentivize the youth or something needs to be done. And if they are after money yeah. and they're after material things, yeah. then let's give it to them. You know what I mean? Let's, instead of having six cars in the Plural Light Brigade, let's have four and give two S5s to you if you finish your degree. Yeah. One for you, one for your wife. The X5 won't kill us, but now we have a doctor who's working at Bera and healing. A sick father who worked on a mine and now has contracted something, so his family must start. You get what I'm saying? You can serve so many more people with that, with that education that you can get. So, but I think we're glorifying it in the wrong way. It mustn't be that you can finish this and you'll have money, and then you can buy cars and live in Morningside in a gated community. It must be that you can go and work at a hospital and save lives. You understand? That's a service that you're providing to your country. Whatever it is, if you want to be in office, you can be the next youth leader. But go and educate yourself first. Go and learn about people like Steve Pico and Robert Sabukwe. What message were they trying to teach? Me as a leader, a future leader, what message am I going to teach? Am I going to send out a message that I have 12 bodyguards, a convoy of cars and a mansion, and I come to you in Alex where the rats are carrying you away and I say, hey, let's have a life like white people. <laughs> what is that? You know, there's poor white people and there's rich white people. You can't generalize and say, let's have a, a life like white people. I once spoke about it on my show and I said, what they should be saying is, let's have a life like PEE -E tycoons. Let's all get tenders. There's simply not enough to go around. You know what I mean? It's, it's unrealistic if that is the dream that we're projecting to the youth. And if they think that they can all get it one day, then we're in serious trouble. Because we, that shortage of engineers, doctors, etc. is just going to continue. Especially if the talent that does finish leaves the country. Yeah. Where will that leave us? Professor, would you like to come in there and add to that? Well, I think... I, I, I think... Uh, you got it absolutely right. That uh, once we acquire education, what is the purpose? What do we want to use it for? Uh, for self-aggrandizement or for the emancipation of society? Mm -hmm. I think that is a very important point. Uh, I think I also would like to comment on the points that have been made by, 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 by the two gentlemen in the studio. From what I could, I, could, I, could, I could deduce, analyze what they were saying, I think the issue of, of, of symbolism is very important in society. In, in other words, what kind of symbols do we generate as society? And, 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 and how do we use these symbols in our society? So it's, it's, it's very important going forward for South Africa and learning from the example of Robert Sobe that the first important symbol is starts with yourself. The issue of self-discipline, the issue of ethical leadership, these are issues that we should keep on, keep on emphasizing in South Africa today. South Africa is in a very, very challenging position currently. The, the, the spiritual impoverishment of African communities makes my heart bleed. Spiritually impoverished communities, you find people who lack self-love, 
Once you lack self-love, you cannot love another person. So it's not only material impoverishment which is eating the lives of black people, but there is serious spiritual impoverishment. Um, your closing remarks, starting with you, Professor. Well, my closing remark is that uh, I think there's a lot of work that we need to do with the youth and also for the youth. We owe our young people. We owe them exam an exemplary life. We owe them ethical leadership. We owe them leadership which leaves the talk. There's a lot that we owe our, our young people. And really, I think we need to expound and explain and write about Robert Sobukwe, write about Steve Biko, so that they understand these two leaders. Corey? Uh, I think that, I don't know, I, th I think that the youth, like um, what the professor, is Professor Tami in Cape Town? Mr. Tami Kaplaki, yes. Mr. Tami Kaplaki was saying is that um, nobody, nobody taught it to Steve Biko and nobody taught Robert Subukwe. So he, he was saying that the youth need to go out and teach themselves because uh, education is not confined to the four walls of a classroom. Well, I think he's alone in that. Uh, they're not going to teach themselves. They need to be taught from school level because they just that's just not what they're interested in. That's the bottom line. Yeah. I deal with 10 to 15,000 of them every weekend and they do not want to go out and do it for themselves. They don't. That's just the reality, unfortunately. unfortunately. Yeah, it is I, unfortunate because, I, uh, you know, he's making really good points and I yeah. wish there were people like that. But the, the, there are some. I'm not saying all the youth is bad and Star Wars. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is there are so few that I think maybe we need to actually give them that helping hand and teach them. Maybe if they know about it, they'll say, hey, I'm going to hit up the library this evening or I'm going to Google Robert Subukwe and I'm going to educate myself. You understand? Mm -hmm. What is black consciousness? I'm going to go and do it. I'm going to go find out about it. Maybe that will put them on the path to do it. But expecting them to just do it themselves because some of the names on street signs in Pretoria <laughs> is really it's unrealistic and it's going to take too long. In the interim, we yeah. will be stuck with the leadership True. that is, which will be followed by leadership that is following the example of the previous leadership. And at the moment, that example is, if I'm in politics, I will have a tender. That is the example. Not if I'm in politics, I can make a change. I, I, that's, hey, if I had to get into politics, Professor, <laughs> <laughs> the first thing I want let is a tender. Let me I don't want to change anything. <laughs> let me correct you. It's not, it's not that bad. No, no, we, but I'm saying, in have, an extreme case, let's no, treat no, no, no. it as it is that bad, so have that we can do something. Even today we do. Stay <laughs> now. We're going to be able to but continue this conversation, you. Warwick, um, <laughs> after we have said goodbye to our uh, uh, listeners at home. So, uh, your comments very quickly. Look, I, um, I agree with um, Warris, you know, that the info is out there, but the youth is not... The year, if I'm five or I'm six, I'm 13, I'm not going to go to the library seeking for the info. Because, you know, the info on Robert Sabuku is fighting against TV, which, which Steve Biko didn't have, and Robert Sabuku didn't have. It's fighting against Facebook, Twitter, and everything else which they, which they didn't have. I mean, they could pick up a book on their own, but we've got all these other things that, you know, are, are demanding our attention because everybody's doing it and it's cool. You know, so if we're pointed out in, in the right direction by the teacher, like I said, bring it to class, then perhaps the young person's going to go, out of class and research more, Google more on you know what they've been told about. But if I don't know about them, trust me, the young person there's no ways they're gonna go and you know uh, have that onus on themselves to go research about these people and their teachings. Highly unlikely. Highly unlikely. Well, that's how we wrap up Frank Talk Radio Dialogues. This session, at least, of the Frank Talk Radio Dialogues. We will be continuing the conversation um, after 8 o'clock, uh, and we will be opening up the floor so that we can give our live uh, studio audiences an uh, opportunity to get to ask our panelists uh, the various questions. I can believe and I can understand that from the comments that we made, they do have quite a few comments and questions uh, that they would like to pose to our panelists. But for you, uh, the listener at home, thank you very much for joining us for another session of Frank Talk Radio Dialogues. 
Join us again, same time, same place, next time. And of course, from ourselves and from our panelists, thank you very much to Mr. Tamika Blake, who's joining us from Cape Town, Professor Gwandiwe Gondro, thank you very much for joining us, as well as Sol Punduka, as well as DJ Warasen. That's how we wrap up this edition of Frank Talk Radio Dialogues. I'm your host, Faith Mangop. Until next time, salute. <laughs>